And now to introduce the keynote speaker of Friday, Emily Darling. We are very happy to have her with us today. She is trained as a coral reef ecologist and she is happiest counting corals underwater has won international awards for her research at the intersection of coral communities and life history traits, climate change of, and multiple stressors, and conservation priorities for coral reefs. As the director of coral reef conservation at the Wildlife Conservation Society, she leads a global program to conserve and monitor a connected network of climate refuges for coral reefs, and is also the co-founder of Mermaid, a global standard in coral reef monitoring data used in 30 countries by more than 1,000 scientists worldwide and endorsed by the United Nations. Emily Darling, the floor is yours. Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Adriana uh, and Andy, for this invitation to be here. Um, for you all for getting it together to be here at 8.30 on the last morning. Much appreciated. Um, so today, I'd love to start off with a story um, about Ovalau Island. This is in Fiji in the South Pacific. In 2016, the largest cyclone to make landfall in the Southern Hemisphere made landfall here, and it caused a huge um, impact for this village of Nao'o. People lost their fishing boats, their crops. Uh, there was no access to clean water uh, for clean drinking water uh, for many days. But the people were able to survive because they had managed their local tembu, or a locally managed reef area, for thousands of years. And so they were able to open up this closed area during the cyclone and feed their families. And this was how they survived until aid was, was, had arrived. Several years later, I was part of a team of Wildlife Conservation Society scientists. And we'd been invited back to the village to look at how their reefs and that tambu had been recovering after the cyclone. And on our way out to do surveys, uh, we were stopped by a village elder who said, you know, we've left this tambu open since the cyclone. We've still been fishing it, but we're worried about whether there's enough fish so that we can make it through the next cyclone because we know more climate disasters are coming. So can you, what do you think? So we went out and did coral reef surveys, and you're going to be seeing a lot of photos like this today because this is one of the main ways that we monitor the health, function, and resilience of coral reefs underwater. When we came back, we were able to enter the data into Mermaid, something else you're going to be hearing a lot about today. And this is really important because we were offline in a remote village, but we were able to enter our biodiversity monitoring data, get our indicators, key indicators of coral reef health, on the fly while we were offline, and bring it back to the village that evening. Now, normally, we would have had to take our underwater monitoring papers and sheets back to Suva, enter them into Excel, clean up the data, processes that you're all familiar with. But instead, that evening around the Kava Bowl, we were able to show the community the data and give them the answer to the question they had asked, which was, they're absolutely right. Fish were below some critical thresholds of productivity, but the coral cover was actually recovering very well from the cyclone. And so the next day, the community decided to close their tambu, and it's currently now recovering and rebuilding that fish biomass and those important fisheries uh, in preparation for the next time that they'll need it. And this is just one example of, of a community who has been using their biodiversity monitoring data for what they need to use it for. And, and that's what I'd like to talk about today, about meeting data with users to really inform action that can scale up globally. So I think I don't need to impress upon you that coral reefs are an important ecosystem just like so many ecosystems on our planet. They support nearly one billion people worldwide with food security, nutrition and culture, uh, that coastal protection. Coral reefs reduce 97% of wave energy, striking coastlines, and of course uh, are an incredible source of biodiversity on our planet. One in four species um, are found on coral reefs despite them occupying less than 1% of, of, of our planet. 
And of course, climate change is a huge problem. So the oceans have absorbed over 90% of the excess heat um, from greenhouse gas emissions. 14% of coral has been lost since 2010 due primarily to climate change. And models suggest that the majority of coral habitat is in jeopardy by mid-century. And I think we can all appreciate that. So given recent climate disasters, this is a, a, a graph we're all familiar with. Um, where September has been the hottest month ever recorded in history, and we're starting to see headlines like this, where even coral restoration sites in Florida that were meant to save corals in some way are bleaching, and there's a push to actually get coral out of the sea uh, and protect it from climate change, and we'll come back to that in a, in a moment. So we certainly see climate action in the streets. This is a photo of activists. Um, and citizens at UN Climate Week last month. And so where do we see climate action in our international policies? Well, obviously the global biodiversity framework is something we have been talking a lot about this week. And it's been a critical milestone in how we connect the crises of biodiversity loss and climate action and really push countries into how do we measure progress and turn, turn this around. So for coral reefs, which is what I'd like to focus on today and thinking about this, little orange filefish, who is one of the uh, most sensitive species to climate change and a great umbrella species. Um, but you know, it's not just about species, it's about ecosystems when we talk about coral reefs. So as part of a WCS team, we were really um, focused on promoting goal A, which is to focus on the integrity, connectivity, and resilience of all ecosystems and ensuring those are maintained, enhanced, and restored. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about our work in the context of this goal and also some other targets that we'll be focusing on uh, in the coming years through our conservation work. And, and these are targets that you'll also all be familiar with. So how do we really measure these targets? That's what I'd like to focus on today. When we think about coral reefs, uh, we really think about the GBF monitoring framework and what are the indicators in there. And I'm really proud to say that we're very happy as scientists with the indicators in this framework because they really represent what is going on with the health, the function, uh, as well as the biodiversity of this ecosystem. So indicators um, that we'll be working on and that you'll be more familiar with during this talk are indicators like the percent of living coral cover on a reef, the uh, hard coral cover compositions, the different types of species and genera within coral communities. Um, the extent of coral reefs is something we're looking to increase within various types of conserved and protected areas, as well as increasing sustainable fish stocks. And by doing all of these things, we're really focusing on this goal A of ecological integrity. So to give you a sense of what we look for <clears throat> underwater, I wanted to um, me, uh, introduce you to Dr. Nyuera Mutiga, who is a leading marine scientist in Kenya um, and who taught me to do my coral reef surveys uh, many years ago. And so what we look for underwater and what Nyuera is assessing here is, first of all, you know, are, there, are we going to be seeing an increase in coral cover and an increase in coral functional types uh, through the work of the GBF? And she's also going to be wanting to look for, are we seeing an increase in the reef fish biomass and diversity on a reef? And so these are things you can really see underwater, and that's why we do these surveys underwater. And so the, some of the questions I'd like to address today, now that you have this context of what we do underwater on coral reefs, is how do we support 100 countries as they measure these indicators of ecological integrity? And what are some of the barriers, opportunities, and innovations uh, for coral reef monitoring as we really try to accelerate this? And hopefully, you'll also all be thinking about what are the various roles that GeoBon can play uh, in this work. So there's three things that I'd really like to, to touch on today. And that's first that in situ field observations are urgent and important for coral reefs. Um, that people using the same technologies is what will catalyze global monitoring networks around the world. And finally, a call for really focusing on cloud native data in order that we can accelerate science, conservation, and policy impact. And when we talk about cloud native data, as I'm sure many of you here know, we're really thinking about how do we not download large files <laughs> to our computers when we're doing a lot of this analysis, but how do we speed up and streamline workflows and transparency and reproducible and open source tools working, working in the cloud. 
Um, and one of the things I think about there is how do we make sure that those cloud native technologies are accessible to the places like the community in NOO in Fiji. So the first thing I'd like to highlight is this role of field observations. Obviously, we're here at GEO. We're hearing a lot about satellites and remote sensing, and those are important, an important complement to how we uh, think about what is the total extent of coral habitat on our planet. So we've been partnering with the Allen Coral Atlas, which is one of the, um, you know, using incredible planet scope dove imagery to um, sweep the planet at very high resolution, you know, almost daily, and say, well, where are their coral reefs? And so the way it does that, I just wanted to point out, is by pulling up the spectral you know, signatures and saying, well, what is the spectral signature of a coral reef? And now, the issue of where the satellites are now is that um, live coral is actually the same spectral image as dead coral. And so when we're looking at coral extent from the Allen Coral Atlas, you know, if we zoom into these um, red pixels and we zoom into what is a pixel actually being classified as, it's being classified as coral slash algae. Now, many of you who are familiar with the coral reef literature will know that we've spent decades actually showing that this distinction is quite important. Um, and describes tipping points between ecosystems, very difficult hysteresis to come back, but whether an ecosystem is dominated by living coral or in fact living algae is a big deal. And so this is where we need to complement these types of remote sensing data sets with underwater observations. And I'd just like to make the point as well that being underwater and training a global network of scientists, whether those are professional scientists or citizen scientists, is one of the only ways we can currently count fish and also how we can assess the ecological integrity of coral reefs. And this is great because scientists have been doing this all over the world. And there are already existing networks of, of scientists, of divers, of people underwater who are very, very good at these methods. And we've standardized what are the key indicators and what are the key methodologies we use to gather this, this type of information. So the pain point that I wanted to talk about in terms of you know, how do we move this data from the reef and into the global monitoring framework or support these 100 countries is, is right here. Um, this is probably one of my favorite field offices, as you can imagine. Um, there's no power, uh, there's no running water, we were sleeping on, on hammocks. Um, and this was after about six hours underwater diving, so we're all like a little narked out and pretty tired. And now we have to come back and type in all of the Latin names of hundreds of fish species we saw on our dives into Excel. And that's the process that most coral reef scientists would use. So we've got our identification books, we've got our underwater paper, and then we have our Excel files in front of us. And so you can imagine that there's a lot of typos in all the Latin names that we're trying to type in after these very long days in the field. And this will be weeks of expeditions for scientists. So when we come back to you know, internet and have some hot showers and recover, then we have to look at these Excel files that we've you know, chicken scratched out in the field and clean them. And that can take weeks and sometimes even months. And so this is the real pain point that technology uh, can address and we decided we wanted to address. Um, and just in one note, I wanted to share that you know, scientists have sometimes a bad rap that you know, you've got to claw my data out of my cold, dead hands about data sharing. But that's not really true anymore for coral reefs. And I'd just like to highlight that in a paper I led a few years ago, over 100 coral reef scientists sent me their raw data and said, let's combine this and really understand a baseline of coral reefs around the world. Um, the problem is that everybody sent me their Excel files from field stations like this in completely different formats. And so for all of you who've wrangled data before, and especially other people's data, um, you know, this took six years. And so it's, a good, I, it's, it's good that it's a postdoc project since it's now acceptable for postdocs to take six years. Um, but you know, this just takes way too long. And so I think there's a huge momentum in our community to share and aggregate data faster. Um, and so we've, we've got to move away from Excel uh, in many cases to do that. So I'd like to introduce you to, to one of our superheroes of our approach to tackle that problem, which, uh, which is mermaid. Um, this is Shinta Pardede, one of our first mermaids from Indonesia, who she was tasked with um, managing the data across 4,000 
uh, kilometers of an archipelago of Indonesia from hundreds of different scientists, hundreds of different monitoring teams, and she was struggling with all of those same issues in Excel that, that I was struggling with. This is Yashika Nand, um, our very first mermaid, as you can see from her tail, um, and uh, she had the same problem in Fiji. And so what we did was we came together and said, there's got to be a better way to, to deal with this problem. And so I'd like to introduce you to MERMAID. It stands for a Marine Ecological Research Management Aid. And I'm happy to tell you the story of how we came up with that another time. Um, but the real point of MERMAID is that it's one of the first online and offline global data platforms for underwater coral monitoring surveys with a very simple mission. And that mission is data in and clean data out. And so MERMAID really tries to accelerate this um, timeline from collecting data to entering data and then to actually using your data. And by being able to, you know, make Mermaid available freely to all coral reef scientists around the world, you know, scientists like Sangita and her student at the University of the South Pacific are able to, to look at their data on the boat as they're heading back to shore uh, to engage with community members or walk into a meeting with uh, government of Fiji officials. And so the way we've done that is by replacing Excel with a series of very simple, standardized, and structured web forms that you can then aggregate and report on and visualize and see um, very quickly in the cloud. So to give you just a quick idea of that, um, is Mermaid is structured around a bunch of different projects. So here's an example from Mozambique, where Mozambican scientists would set up a project for an expedition they're going out to do. They could add users to, or they have added users to the project, um, who's going to be collecting data or administering data, um, who might be able to only download it or use it, so users with different roles. Um, they're then able to collect a series of different types of sample units or methodologies that we use underwater to get at these GBF indicators. Um, you can then enter in the data, so instead of typing in our long Latin names, you, using just a few letters, you can pull up accepted taxonomies and species lists, verified and worms, and calculate your indicators on the fly. And so you can do this online or offline. And so here you can see we're able to, you know, get total biomass of fish species just as we're typing them in. And that's because we've linked each species to its fish base coefficients, which also would be something that could take scientists, um, you know, quite a long time to do by themselves. Um, and finally, we have a series of verifications through warnings and errors in case you've missed data, like I have here, or um, just things to, to alert you on, on the data. So this has been really powerful because it's solving critical problems that every coral reef scientist has, and we're really proud to share that this is now being used around the world. Um, you can go to dashboard.datamermaid.org and explore yourself. Um, we're nearing 50,000 surveys from 5,000 sites. Um, we have over 1,500 users, and this is used in 35 countries by over 70 organizations. What's really cool is when you submit your data, you can see it, and, and this is the really key thing. So here's a survey in Mozambique. This was a, a collaboration between um, national institutions and universities, the government of Mozambique and WCS, to set up new marine protected areas and identify priority sites uh, in northern Mozambique. And so from these surveys, which you can see here as the red dots, as you zoom into each survey, you're able to see you know, what are those key GBF indicators. So what is living coral cover versus algae? And then what is the composition and, uh, and biomass of the fish communities? So I'm really pleased to share this quote with you from Sangeeta. Um, and I'll just let you read it for a quick moment. So the second point I'd like to make um, is that when people use the same technology, this will catalyze monitoring networks. Um, and one of the things we really had to address uh, in this work is something I think you've all, anyone who's ever had to work with numbers or data has had to address, which is data sharing. 
So very early on, we worked with our users right away to say, how are we going to share this data? You want to see your data on a dashboard. You know, we don't want to have everyone logging in, but you know, just to see their own data, because we know there's a broader community here that we can catalyze. So how can we do that appropriately for you? So this is a photo from our first user summit uh, in 2018, where we worked with users to say, what, is, what are appropriate ways to share your data, to share your biodiversity and monitoring data? And we came up with three different types of data sharing options. So within each project, users can choose to make all of their data public. So this would be, you can see here, the raw data is able to be downloaded. That's that little blue button um, by the data. Users alternatively could choose to make only their averages, so average coral cover or average fish biomass publicly available. Um, so you can't download the raw data, but you can still see it on the platform and access it um, through, through, through other ways. Um, but that would be accessing only the averages. Or you can make your data completely private. Um, and so you can see here that it's, the data are grayed out and the download data button is grayed out as well. But users are able to, to choose which one of those are most appropriate for them. And so, for example, back to Fiji, um, in Fiji and most of the Pacific, um, sharing fish data is simply not appropriate. It would be like um, sharing the information in your bank account or your Gmail password. These are things that are very important to communities that they protect and that they don't want to be shared publicly. And so we were able to work with users and say that makes perfect sense that you don't want to share your fish belt data, um, but they still want to contribute to things like the GBF around other indicators. And so we were able to set data sharing choices by method, and that's been a huge advance for how coral reef scientists can share data. And so you can see here that you know, our, our fisherman from NOAA is happy, giving us a thumbs up because his fish belt data is protected and private. Um, but the benthic cover data, which is coral cover or algae cover or several of those other GBF indicators, that's you know, completely fine to share, and so they have. Um, and so I think this, for me, what I really learned is that people are so willing to overcome problems around data sharing if you meet them where they are and really ask, you know, what is appropriate to you and how can we do this together um, and not, you know, simply assume that people won't share or want to share everything, but you can really navigate into interesting compromises um, like this. And this seems to be working for scientists and communities and their partners and governments all over the world, um, in, a, in addition to, to our users here in Fiji. So being able to share data is obviously really important. Um, I'm on the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network's data task force. Um, we're refreshing a lot of reports that move up through the UN system on reporting. And having access to data, you know, being able to download sort of as much of this data that's public or publicly available all in one go is a huge win because otherwise the authors of these reports have to email you know every single person individually get every single person's different excel files wrangle those into the same thing aggregate compile all the things that we're trying to avoid um, so i think by working by meeting users where they are with technology you know it's not only important for those individual users but it can also scale up into into global global networks and global reporting that we're all familiar with um, lastly, I just wanted to make, to share um, why I think cloud native data is so important to be accelerating our impact, um, as well as accelerating our, our scientific discoveries. And so by cloud native, you know, I, we described it a little bit earlier, but I wanted to give you some specific examples. One is that Mermaid has an R package, um, Mermaid R, one of my favorite features. Um, Online through all of our documentation, you can go and install this library, use it to access and authenticate to your specific data, and download multiple projects and instantly compile them, and then start to set up reproducible and transparent code. And so then when people add more projects or add more data, you just rerun your R code. And so that's one example of, of cloud native that, that, we're, um, that we've developed. And the other is a cloud native approach to not only um, you know, make sure you're not downloading data into your computer, because then that causes lots of version control issues, but you can also get data off your computer. And so we've also created our libraries that allow you to upload your existing spreadsheets, you know, once you put them into an uploading format, and upload those directly into your Mermaid project. And so these are two features directly 
asked for by users that we've developed that continue to just push all this data into the cloud and make um, biodiversity monitoring even easier for, for everyone to use and to really you know, reduce those pain points um, of data collection. And once you do all this hard work, then you can have the like cool, sexy apps. So this is what we're developing right now. So through, by being able to have, um, so all of Mermaid is completely based on APIs. Um, so by being able to have our API documentation, by having stacks, these are spatial temporal asset catalogs that many of you are familiar with, we're linking into, you know, what are the key data li layers? Um, that of temperature, of chlorophyll, of fishing pressure that people want to use with their analyses. And then by being able to use some really cool stuff like T-Tyler, we can put all of those, and I should say, by we, it's the, our developers, <laughs> put all of these together, you know, into apps. And so this lets people, you say, you know, I want to use this data from this place to address this question and have this app. And I think cloud native technology is also so critical because it lets people customize what they want. There's never going to be, you know, what the government of Fiji wants is going, is never going to be the same as what the government of the Maldives wants or what scientists want to use. And so by being, you know, a cloud native data platform and by all of us building that into our workflows around biodiversity monitoring data going forward, it just lets people bring together data really quickly and efficiently in the ways that they need. Um, so we've, we've been really excited about, about this. So when we can do this, I wanted to give you three quick snapshots of the type of science we can do now very quickly that we couldn't do before. Um, this is a paper in proofs, uh, hence the lovely colors of the author names. Um, but coming out shortly um, is a product of an expert synthesis group that I led at SNAP. Um, this is related to target three that of 30 by 30 we're all familiar with. But we were able to look across seven different countries and their fish biomass data and show that um, ecological outcomes were achieved under different management objectives and different management rules. And that's important because we show that potential OECMs as well as MPAs can all be achieving biodiversity outcomes. And we weren't able to do that before because it was really difficult to take all of these data from all of these different places and compile them. But with things like Mermaid, we're able to now advance um, this type of policy relevant science. A paper that just came out earlier uh, this month, um, led by uh, James Robinson from Lancaster University, also used mermaid data from four countries and showed that herbivores on coral reefs have the highest nutrient productivity for coral reef fisheries. And that's really important because it suggests that herbivores, so these are parrotfish or grazing surgeon fishes, need precautionary management in fisheries because they support food security for coastal communities. But we also know those are some of the most important ecological species on a reef because they scrape and remove algae so that baby corals can settle and replenish demographic populations. Um, again, you know, data that wouldn't have been, or insights that wouldn't have been possible uh, without things like mermaid. Um, and lastly, here's where we're really moving next with Mermaid, which is thinking about target eight of how do we minimize the impacts of climate change on coral reefs. And this is something um, that I've worked on for, for quite a long time, which is, you know, where are climate resilient coral reefs? How do we prioritize those? And how can those be a key cornerstone of our conservation going forward? Um, and so uh, last month we published this paper, which is a review showing that there are three ways that corals can survive climate change, and we can find them based on their community fingerprint underwater. So based on the types of coral species and their life history traits and their functional groups, we're able to categorize reefs into three different types of refugia. The refugia that can avoid climate change, the ones that have been exposed to it but can resist it, and the ones that have been exposed to climate change had significant mortality but then be recovering. And so those are three different mechanisms of climate resilience, and we can you know, now see those using data sets like Mermaid. So stay tuned, um, and would be happy to talk to folks more about this. And because this is where we really need to go for coral reef conservation, which is you know, how do we conserve a globally connected network of climate resilient reefs as a key uh, target uh, by, by 2030? And from being a coral reef scientist who's had the great privilege of seeing these resilient reefs around the world that are still out there now, there is every possibility to find these reefs. Um, but you know, these 
data sets and catalyzing these monitoring networks is so critical to be able to, to do that and share those stories and that data to policymakers, decision makers, local communities, people who actually make decisions about natural resources. And so this to me is how we really achieve goal A, which is um, you know, this globally connected network of coral reefs is a blueprint um, for the future biodiversity and recovery of coral reefs. Um, and feel free to go to hopeunderwater.com, um, which is more of an infographic and, and provides more background on, on this paper and this idea. So taking a quick break back to um, Andy and our GBIOS and this figure, which we are all now very familiar with and certainly um, I was inspired by, um, how does this connect to coral reefs? So I think when we think about building a bond I can see quite clear connections into how we standardize biodiversity methods, tools, and technologies that coral reef scientists are using around the world. This is really important at a national scale. Um, for example, Fiji's data from over 900 sites from all these different partners that you saw is not only contributing to Nao'o Village and their tembu, but it's contributing to how Fiji achieves its national ocean policy with the goals of protecting 30% of their national waters um, and 100% sustainable management of their coral reefs. By Fiji developing its national ocean policy, I can see that linking up into global networks because of cloud native reproducible workflows and apps. So the code that Fiji's scientists or mermaids analysts will be supporting Fiji on is made public. And because it links to you know, the same data set or points to the same API endpoints, other people can reproduce that. And that's exactly what we're doing in the Philippines. So uh, in Last month, uh, Philippines led a national workshop thinking about their marine spatial planning and 30 by 30 priorities, and they'll be able to use the same technologies and workflows um, you know, with their mermaid data. And I'm really excited about this because this is achieving another even more important target, which is how do we jointly develop technologies that are accessible, um, especially to lower income countries, um, and develop south to south partnerships. And so what we'll be doing in this project is making sure that the scientists and decision makers from Fiji and the Philippines are connecting themselves and able to share themselves how they're working with the data, how they're working with their partners, and leading on their various 30 by 30 planning goals. So this is an ambitious dream, the global biodiversity framework, and perhaps even more ambitious, everyone being happy with it in about six and a half years. Um, but how do we get there is things that I think a lot about. Um, and I think, you know, addressing our climate crisis is equally important and critically and fatefully interconnected to the success of, of the GBF. Um, but there has been no better time in, you know, to be a scientist really trying to engage with these policy processes. Um, and it's been a, a great privilege of mine um, to think about how does science scale up into these processes. But to me, it always comes back to um, who are the scientists in the field? What data are they collecting and what are, what are their needs? But there's, there's great opportunities for scientists to engage in these processes. There's no sugarcoating it, however. Coral reefs, like many ecosystems on our planet, are, are in crisis. Um, I think about this headline a lot, a desperate push to save Florida's coral, get it out of the sea. That's crazy to think about. So what they're talking about here is all of the Acropora that they planted in these restoration efforts has bleached because of super hot temperatures in September. And so all of these corals that were supposed to survive, that were supposed to be replanted, they're bleaching and dying. And so what people are doing now is going out to these restoration nurseries and pulling, pulling these corals off and taking them to land and putting them in cooler water. So we're gonna learn a lot about restoration R&D and all of those options need to be on the table going forward. Um, but you know, what we're learning from this is that we cannot technologically solve our way out of the climate crisis with restoration. And I think we need to focus a lot more on where is the natural resilience of our ecosystems at all different levels of biodiversity, because that's what's out there in nature. And how do we you know, really reduce other local pressures and certainly tackle our climate crisis at the same time and, and keep, keep temperatures cooler. 
So a few thoughts to leave you with um, here is that nature is incredibly resilient, as I think you've all seen. And even coral reefs, sort of the poster child for climate change, there's still incredible resilience out there on natural reefs. By embracing and accelerating near real-time monitoring, we're able to find and communicate that resilience, um, and particularly through the lens of ecological integrity, function, and resilience. And it's so crucial to focus on those types of data because that's what's linked into ecosystem services, whether that's coastal protection or food security or local economies, um, as well as biodiversity, of course. And, and that's what really the policymakers care about, as we know. Um, to get there, um, I think we can really think about how people can be using the same technologies more. Of course, there's going to be different technologies and different approaches, but before you go off and start your next cool software cloud-native app, talk to other folks, see what's already out there, and see how you can build and co-develop. Maintaining these platforms, developing these platforms is a huge undertaking, as we all know. Um, and I think as scientists, we sometimes forget that there's other things out there that we could add to and we could build to, and instead we're just all creating our own things. And I think if we really want to get into these monitoring networks and achieve the vision of GBIOS, we have to really be thinking, you know, what are technologies out there that are working, and how do we build and add uh, and really slipstream into that? And then also I would encourage all of you, especially you know, early career scientists, um, to really embrace modern software development. Um, building for the cloud has been a, a huge game changer in how Mermaid is used by field scientists around the world, even in some of the most remote and difficult to connect places on the planet. By you know, having cloud native apps that support offline data entry when we're in the field, but then you know, when you're back with connectivity, people are able to upload their data, compile their data, visualize their data. Um, and it's just things that we, we haven't been able to do. Um, and this is just a, a really exciting time in terms of modern apps and modern data. And I think um, that's what we've really seen as, as critical in catalyzing a global monitoring network of Mermaid. Um, please feel free to get in touch. Um, it's been a, a wonderful honor uh, to be here this week and share some of our, our stories from coral reefs and from Mermaid um, with you. There are so many people um, behind all the stories you've heard in this talk um, that I would very much like to thank, um, as well as all the people who have supported our audacious vision to never use Excel again um, from the beginning. And with that, I'd like to, to thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. Hello, congratulations, and I really like your technology stack. Um, Thank you. So my question is, uh, have you already, uh, or have you considered integrating uh, the database and um, projects to Ocean Info Hub? The Ocean? Ocean Info Hub. Ocean, I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. Um, we're so let's talk about that afterwards. Um, but certainly thinking about GBIF and OBIS and Darwin Core Standards, those are all you know, in, in terms of how we're, how we're building. I think one of the cool things about building for the cloud is that because it's all API-based, you know, we can simply drive people to our API documentation that you can find online. And if there's a hub that's important for you to connect it into, then you know, that's the, the beauty of open source development and our APIs. Um, but happy to, happy to chat more about that specific yeah, platform. Yeah, you can come and see us at the Bun in a Box booth. So if you integrate it with Ocean Info Hub, uh, the projects are already findable in the Bun in a Box as well. Perfect. So that sounds great. It's the same uh, system. Yeah, behind. I was doing some searching in Bun in a Box and was thinking there needed to be more coral projects. Um, so that was on my, yes, on exactly. my, on my to-do list. Thank you. Hi, that was really awesome. Um, my question for you is about the um, when when the users don't want to share their data, does WCS get to see the data? Does anyone see the data, or or is it nobody sees the data? Yeah, great question. So in terms of who sees private data, um, it's only the people involved in that project. So WCS or Mermaid admin, you know, we don't see all the data at all. It's all very project based. So, for example, um, 
you know, some projects uh, thinking about Indonesia, um, where they're working with the government in a national park, the government owns that data. And so it absolutely cannot be made public, and that's a great way for international scientists to get kicked out of the country, which has definitely happened before, but not to me, um, just for the record. But um, so, you know, there, the whole project needs to be private. So there, um, Shinta would set up a project that's working with national park scientists and national, you know, whoever needs to be involved in that project. She would set um, benthic data to private, and uh, fish data to private, and then all of that data is only available to people who authenticate and log in to that project. Um, they can download all of their data at, you know, as flat Excel files in a standardized format, and then be able to, to send it or create reports or do what they want with it, but um, people who are not in that project can't see it. The one thing you can see is on the dashboard, you can see that there's been a survey at that location, at that place, at that project, and we have a, a button to contact the admins of that project. So for example, the GCRMN, Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, reporting folks, um, they're seeing that there are data in Indonesia, but they don't have access to it, but they have a way to contact Shinta or the other admins and say, hey, we're putting together this report, what are you, what are you interested in? Emily, that was awesome. You are the living embodiment of the Geobon dream. Um, People-based, place-based, connectivity, uh, ambitious, thinking to goals, um, I'm, I'm inspired. Um, so my question, uh, uh, there are two questions. The, the, the core idea of GBIOS is that we learn from each other, both within bonds and among network bonds. So one has that, do you have any examples of where that has happened, where inter-country knowledge has led to a better management when we're thinking about a connected protected area network of reefs? Um, and the second question maybe is a bit uh, bigger, is have you been approached to generalize that to other systems, other contexts? Yeah, yeah, great questions, thanks. Andy. Leading question. <laughs> um, I'll tackle that, that second question first about, you know, so, you know, is merm can mermaid be generalized to the rest of the world or the rest of the oceans or, or whatnot? Um, you know, I think for us to get where we've been, we've really tried to keep a laser focus on underwater coral reef monitoring surveys. Um, we're now building out into AI through photo quadrats. So increasingly, and that's because increasingly we're seeing coral reef scientists, um, GoPros are cheap these days. You take them underwater, you take a lot of photos, you can drop points on them and use AI and deep learning to classify those points. Um, there's, you know, other platforms out there that do a great job at that, but it's difficult to integrate those platforms with fish. So Mermaid, we're bringing in AI module to, to try to do that. Um, but that's remained this laser focus on how do we deliver a great platform for coral reef monitoring scientists. Um, that said, coral reef monitoring scientists also monitor seagrass and mangroves and other things. Um, and those use the same types of transect methods or the same types of photo quadrats. So it would be really interesting to explore how do we scope this out. Um, and then, of course, you get into the practical questions of governance and funding and management and all of those things. But I certainly think um, all of the abstractable pieces of how you're using Mermaid and, and really who it's built for um, is very generalizable. And even through thinking about you know, Yana's and the GEOS project of the Global Ecosystems Atlas, it's like, why don't we use this on you know, high mountain steps or into the grasslands? Or, um, so super interesting question. Um, and we're, we're definitely thinking about that and slightly terrified about that. Um, the second question of countries sharing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I think that um, Indonesia uh, is, has been an incredible leader in thinking about OECMs um, and how you know, they're approaching that. And so by having leading scientists like Esther DeVerry involved in our working group um, on that paper net led by Natalie Ban, uh, looking at biomass and management outcomes, um, Estra was able to take and bring Indonesia's knowledge and, and her experience there to six other countries in the world who are also trying to tackle OECMs. And so from bringing people together around data, we were really just trying to publish that paper, um, you know, really thinking about what are, the bi what are the measurable ecological outcomes. But along the way, and actually much sooner, we published a perspective in Nature on 
OECMs as you know, being able to use every tool in the box for biodiversity. And that was really sparked by bringing different people together, you know, originally around data, but then just to share ideas. And I think that's something that is going to have much longer um, lasting impacts than you know, certainly any, any of these papers, but those, those broader ideas. Um, so yeah, I'm always um, thinking about some late night conversations last night, um, really inspired by synthesis centers and this idea that you initially bring people together to talk about data, but really you're talking, you're bringing them together to spark new ideas that are going to have such a longer lasting legacy. Certainly happy to chat more. It's something I like, uh, I certainly like to do, even if I'm taking a little bit of a break from hosting working groups for a couple of years to regain my sanity. <laughs> Maybe we can take one last question. Oh, in the back. Thanks, Emily. Is this on? Great. Um, thanks, Emily. That was, that was really great to see everything you've been up to. And this is a bit of a follow-up, I think, on Andy's question and your response to it in terms of that laser focus. And it strikes me that this kind of you know, field-based, local distributed monitoring network would be incredible for lots of different kinds of biodiversity. And, you know, insect surveys come to mind immediately or plant mm -hmm. surveys. Are there things about kind of the coral reef community that you think made this possible or kind of mm. made this more effective in terms of you know, already using comparable methods or having a tight network of scientists or things that we mm -hmm. could kind of learn from in other mm -hmm. fields with other taxa? Oh, that's a really good question. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're starting to think now about, about the process, like what got us here? Because obviously, we, we got incredibly lucky. You know, at this moment in time, or that moment in time six years ago, and we were like, I'm so fed up with Excel. It happened to be also the time where, you know, um, we met an incredible developer. So our partners at Spark Geo, you know, they just let us start with $10,000. <laughs> and we started, like, you know, drawing relational databases and putting that into a Django framework. Whereas our other part development partners were like, well, you're clearly going to need to raise $2 million before we'll even talk to you. So I was like, well, I can't, I don't have that money. So I think finding, you know, we got incredibly lucky. We found the right development partners who would build and grow with us. Um, there was an urgency, I think, as well, um, where coral reef scientists were seeing these changes and knowing it wasn't just their places and wanting to compare and build these tools. Um, so there is that interest in being able to share, but at the same time, everyone's totally overworked and underpaid, and it doesn't have the time to clean up those data and contribute. So, a way for people to just simply share their data, um, you know, w made a lot of sense. And and then I think, of course, there's this deep commitment to getting data back to communities and local partners faster. So I don't think any of that is uh, unique to coral reefs. Um, you know, I think one thing we have kept a laser focus on is just what methods are being used by everybody everywhere. And so we've often had a lot of, you know, people come to us and say, oh, I have this really great methodology for measuring sea cucumbers in Belize. Can you add it to Mermaid? And you're like, well, does, ever, does like, who else uses it to measure sea cucumbers? Um, and they're like, well, I don't know. I haven't talked to folks about it. And it's like, okay, well, go talk to the sea cucumber folks. You know, come back, and if when there is a globally standardized a method for, you know, ideally all invertebrates, let's add that in so it can drive, um, you know, the most, get the most bang for your buck from a global community. Um, I think the other thing, too, we've sort of taken a hard line on is you don't get to make up all your own codes and all your own labels, which we see proliferate in a lot of other software. So I think oftentimes we want everybody to be happy. And so if you've got a label set of 200 things and you've got a label set of 30 and somebody else, you know, sure, let's just put it all in. But then we see a lot of platforms with like a, cro a cropper of branching, a cropper of blue branching, a cropper of branching with blue tips. And you're like, what? Like, how do these things even feed into a taxonomy? So we've been really hard lined and said, if it's not in worms, you don't get it. Um, and if you don't like it, you can go back to using Excel. So, and then people still use Mermaid. So, you know, I think I'm thinking a lot about carrot and a stick in these types of governance things, but always keeping that vision of what are we trying to achieve as a community and being really open to trying to negotiate that, of course, with kindness and politeness and trying to figure that out. But again, I don't think that's unique to coral reefs either. Um, 
so yeah, hopefully um, the lessons and, and things we've been thinking about can be useful to, to other groups, as, um, especially insects, which have a special place in my heart um, as, as they're moving forward. Thanks. Thank you so much, Emily. I believe all of us would like to be in Indonesia right now and just count corals underwater. Well, thank you for being here for the keynote this morning.